Uh, like Eric said, uh, I'm planning to run through some of the things that uh, we at Touch Lab look at when we're trying to help a client decide where to start evaluating KMV or co-chairing in general. Um, you know, uh, that's one of the things we do when we come in and, and it's one of our part of one of our services at the refactory um, is finding areas of the code that will deliver a high value to our, our clients um, to bring in as, as the first thing that they share code on. Um, if you remember from Justin's talk yesterday, uh, he told us about how Kotlin multi-platform doesn't require big decisions. Um, and so that's why uh, we've decided, you know, as Touch Lab to, to go that route. And also in this talk, when I'm framing, you know, how you want to start evaluating co-chairing, we're doing it with that framing, with that uh, point of view that you're using something like Kotlin multi-platform where you can start small, you can have a very clean interop story um, that lets you really, you know, pick and choose where the most valuable place for you to start sharing is. So going forward, we can kind of assume I'm talking about sharing with Kotlin multi-platform. Um, and, but, you know, we can also apply these things to other code sharing ideas. Um, I know that looking at the registrations, uh, a lot of people are in the early evaluation phase, either haven't started sharing or um, are looking for a small way to prove out um, that co-chairing can be beneficial. So this talk should help illuminate some of the key areas where uh, you can evaluate your code for value, for ease of sharing, um, and for impact. And, so essentially I'm gonna lay out a few, a few variables, uh, namely the amount of business logic in uh, a part of your code base that might be shared, how important it is to require alignment, how active development in that area of the code is, how it's currently architectured, and most importantly, um, what your current team structure and dynamic is. Uh, so starting there, uh, really, right off the bat, it's important to get or to enlist some advocates from your iOS team as well as your Android team um, to make sure that you can get a full understanding of what is important. So like say to your iOS cell members, what are pain points? What's important? How is the code structured on the iOS side? Um, and to help you identify where iOS developers will see the most benefit. And getting buy-in from, obviously, with something like Hot Multi-Platform, getting buy-in from your iOS developers right off the bat is important. And having an advocate as part of the initiative that can tell you, hey, this, this part of the code is super important to developer A. Um, we should probably not touch that for now. But everybody hates this core data module. Let's let's start working here. Having that kind of input, um, rather than it being some sort of top-down or outside force acting on the iOS team, um, will be really valuable in, in finding the best place to start. Um, but moving from there, you know, after you've got an input from everybody who, who you can really, uh, looking for areas of the code that have a significant amount of business logic. It is, it's very possible to share a, a feature that is nothing but a network response getting piped into the, the UI. Um, you know, we, we've done that, um, but it's not where the most value is. Uh, there is a cost associated with setting up co-chairing, with setting up um, Kotlin multi-platform, and to really see the value from it, you do want something that has some sort of significant uh, processing, some sort of significant business logic. Um, so these might be things like uh, some processing of user input before it gets sent out to the server. It might be managing critical state through an onboarding out of box experience. Uh, it might be managing data flow of those network responses through your uh, through some sort of persistence into some sort of offline mode, handling caching, that kind of thing can take what otherwise might be, you know, a really thin 
a really small uh, shared layer and, and expand it into something that's that's meaningful. So certainly look for something that has a bit of that local processing, a bit of that business logic. Uh, important areas that that might that might include are areas that were like strictly require alignment between the two platforms. Um, there are some things that if it's not perfectly aligned between the platforms, it's just not going to function. So these are normally some sort of communication object. Uh, so it could be a network response. It could be a analytics event, some other serialized type that needs to go over the wire. These are things that if it's not aligned between the platforms, something's going to break. And a lot of times we look at these and they seem overly simple as things to share. It that seem, you know, wrapping analytics events or names or, or you know, seems a little a little over simple, but having an area where that delivers that much value and is simple to build out a, a proof of concept on, I think seems like a no-brainer a lot of the time. Um, other things, if you know, if you've knocked out the those high value uh, areas, or you don't want to start there, um, is to look at the parts of your code that are going to have active development, how active development is in a particular part of your code. And the reason I call this out is if there's a piece of code that no one's ever going to touch again, you know, developer B wrote that processor five years ago and it's well tested and well understood and nobody you know wants to touch it um, and it's not causing any problems it might not make sense to rock the boat for that particular piece because having it written once if no one's ever going to go uh, work on it again doesn't deliver a whole lot of value uh, that that said there is um, something to be said for testing this out in a well-tested, well-understood part of the code and isolated part of the code. So it's a little bit of, you, you have to um, evaluate this yourself, but making sure that you keep it in mind. Sort of a, a, a related note on that is thinking about what people are going to be developing next, what people are gonna be working on next. Um, so, if we know that a particular module is is in the works, is coming soon, that can sometimes be a good opportunity to say, this is where we'll start writing things once instead of twice. Um, so thinking about what parts of the code are active and what parts of the code are going to be active uh, can really help you find value in code sharing. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to hit on is the existing architecture of your app. So as you're looking to do code sharing, um, you're inherently going to have to be pulling concerns out away from your app. Um, a lot of you are probably already modularizing and uh, separating concerns and building out a, a clean architecture and Finding those areas that are separated can, can make for some easy wins when talking about starting code sharing. So if you have a feature that is already fully pulled out, uh, that can be a good option. Um, there is the, the uh, train of thought of let's pick the part of the code that's as messy as possible and take this as an opportunity to make it better. But we found that at least starting out, um, you don't want to necessarily make your life a lot harder. Um, so looking for, looking for or building out those parts of the code that are well modularized and uh, in good separation of concerns can make your life a lot easier for shared code. And we've talked about this concept that, sh at least with Kotlin multi-platform, well-architected code is already shareable. Um, you know, most of the work of separating things out of, of isolating your uh, business logic is stuff that we've already wanted to do for good testable code anyway. Uh, and so continuing down that train of thought when you're looking at where is the best place to start uh, can be good. 
So those were sort of the, the bullet points, the, the talking points that I wanted to introduce to start the conversation. Um, none of those variables are silver bullets or black and white, um, you know, things that are going to point you directly to the right piece of code, but they're all variables that it makes sense to look at when you're trying to make this, this uh, decision. So hopefully that's helpful to everybody. And uh, at this point, I think we'll, we'll bring uh, Russell, who's our uh, senior mobile developer and, and Kevin, who's our uh, founder slash KMP guru slash speaker. And, uh, and we'll field some of your questions. Let me pull up. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Eric. So um, the the sorry, I was um, unmuting myself. Um, the first question that we have, and I think uh, Kevin's going to go ahead and take on uh, take it on, is um, the question is from Dorian, and he asks, uh, "What does the bugging and uh, cross platform Kotlin code base look like compared to Kotlin running in a managed environment, i.e., Android runtime?" Um, and then he provides some further clarification: How much harder is it to map back native stack traces to the Kotlin SRC? I guess this is more of a Kotlin native question as opposed to a multi-platform question. Um, so, so Kevin, do you want to share your thoughts on that? Uh, let me make sure. Thanks. Yeah, we can hear you now, sorry. I was back chilling in Slack feverishly, like I can't unmute myself. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, all right. So, um, so the question is uh, debug and um, stack traces and all that kind of stuff. So um, there's kind of a couple questions here. There's this quite literally debugging and um, we made a, an Xcode plugin for Kotlin um, that you can use to directly debug code in Xcode and partially, um, you know, we're expecting there's, there's going to be at some point in the not just the future, JetBrains is releasing an Android Studio plugin that will let you run iOS apps from Android Studio and debug your Kotlin code directly in there. But um, a lot of our work is about how to not completely alienate the iOS team, right? So um, telling people to install entirely different tools that they're not used to, things like that, is not necessarily great for that. So we, we did launch the Xcode plugin for Kotlin and you can um, add your Kotlin code that's from shared and you can debug it with some caveats. One, Xcode, uh, Apple doesn't exactly make this a pleasant process, so installing it is um, some command line stuff. Two, um, you have to, we're currently fighting through some technical issues where if you use the CocoaPods plugin that comes from Kotlin directly, it makes a static library, so we're trying to figure out how you can get decent spec in there. We also forked the CocoaPods plugin, and you can use a dynamic library, that's, that's primarily why we forked it, and then debug, yada, yada, yada but that totally works and you should be able to debug dynamically in Xcode. Um, getting stack traces back, symbolication back, we also put out um, something to piggyback on the work that the native team did to expose essentially symbolication and, and um, stack traces. So uh, it's called Crash Chaos because we didn't come up with a weird branding name, it just is quite literally Crash for Kotlin iOS. And uh, you can have these go to either Crashlytics or Bugsnag, and they should give you symbolicated crash reports if you set it up such that the dsims make their way to the server. And I think you, you kind of have to disable some of the optimizations in the compiler, which we're also doing more testing on that. Because if you do compiling with optimizations, it'll inline a lot of stuff, and that might, that might mess up the stack traces. Uh, but that does work. It's an ongoing place of research though in our, our world, if that answers it. Great, thanks. Um, another question that we have is, and I think Russell's gonna take this, um, we're, we're talking about Android and iOS. Um, what about web apps? Yeah, it looks like there was another question that just came in around web stuff as well. Um, so 
like um, web web is a um, multi-platform target. You you can target uh, JavaScript and build your uh, browser UI from that and and share stuff um, share stuff that way as well. Um, we at Touch Lab are primarily focused on mobile. Um, so like that's what you'll find in um, things like our um, camp kit template. Um, but yeah, web, web is there if you're interested in it. Um, I tend to think that um, mobile is a, um, is a better place to leverage some of the code sharing. Like your, um, your architecture between Android and iOS is typically going to be more similar than your architecture between Android and browser. Um, so you'll like starting, starting with the mobile clients, you'll be able to probably leverage, um, leverage the ability to share code a little better. Um, but if you're interested in, in doing it with, uh, with web as well, um, you certainly can. Great. And, um, I think the I was going to go ahead. Jump, jump in yeah, yeah, like, I, I mean, we at Touch Lab to give like, historical context. I mean, we, we've been uh, a native mobile shop, uh, and frankly, we were Android only shop going back for years, right? So, like, clearly, our focus is weighted heavily towards native mobile, right? Um, that said, you know, <laughs> assuming we have growth in this business, like it, the web side of this is very much a target for what we want to do in the future. Um, but I, I also agree with Russell. Like, it, it, it's kind of like you can imagine a diagram where you have like more pure logic especially if it's complicated pure logic, like if you're doing tax calculations or some crazy stuff that you want to have across all of your things and you want to do it locally, that totally makes sense. Um, technically, you can do SQL Delight in JS, but it's an in-memory compilation of SQL Delight that runs in JS. Like, you know, the, I don't know how many people are actually doing that. I find it academically interesting, but it may not be, you know, it, there are like less obvious places where you're going to share logic. So. Um, Touch Lab admin, what are we, are we going to do the next question there? Um, yeah, yeah. Yes, so I, I think this is actually a great question to kind of uh, end on, um, and it's from Samuel, so, uh, so thank you for asking it. Um, he asked, wanted to set up a, a proof of concept with shared iOS Android for my team uh, at work. Any tips for setting up? Um, so we're actually going to cover um, proof of concepts tomorrow, but, but Kevin, jump in and let us know what you think. Yeah, so CampKit exists because we talk to a number of people who um, essentially your organization will usually say, hey, if you want to take a look at that, here's a bit of time to go make that happen. And often that turns into a hack week, right? And the horror stories we heard were like Android developers getting a hack week and they tried to integrate shared code into their production iOS apps to prove that it works, right? So um, go read the CampKit stuff. That is A, risky especially if you don't recruit somebody from the iOS side, because integrating anything into any production build system is a very difficult process. And if you don't have a lot of experience with the build system on the iOS side, you just, you're going to, you're not going to have that working for probably a couple of days. And that was the experience we had. So it, it turns into something that doesn't turn into a big success. So camp kit exists to try to get as many of those risks out of the way as possible. And please go into the Kotlin Slack and ask for help if you get stuck. And definitely, this is where recruiting someone on the iOS side is at least curious about this concept to help that integration if you're going to try to integrate into your production app. That's my big caveat. Like, understand that, imagine someone from the iOS team deciding they're going to come in and change your Gradle scripts in your production app. It's going to take more than a week to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so that is the risk. But that's, I guess we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Yeah, and, and thank you to, to someone actually shared the link to CampKit. So if you want to take a look at your chat, you can actually see um, our, our repo on GitHub for CampKit. Um, and, and that exactly provides all the resources that Kevin just uh, just walked through. All right, um, we're going to go a little bit over. Um, we have one final question from, from Kurt. Um, Sam, do you want to uh, give your thoughts on it? Sure. So Kurt asked about... Um, managing changes that that span both platforms uh, and not breaking iOS uh, when you make a change on a, only the KMP side. Uh, we, we've certainly run into this uh, this complication and, and fi figuring out how to manage it has really primarily come down more to 
uh, managing the project and and the developers and getting people on board with being multi-platform developers um, and essentially saying that any story is going to uh, be handled on both sides of the uh, of, of the platform uh, of the shared code and that the you know a developer should be comfortable working both sides of that and getting help as needed on the, on whichever platform they're they're less comfortable with that said uh, we've also experimented with the idea of a stable quote you know quote unquote stable version of the library that iOS developers can develop against so that as you add things to the KMP shared part, um, the iOS developers aren't using that out of the bat or out of the gate. Uh, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. It, it makes it more difficult for the iOS developer to uh, make changes, to debug, to get things sorted out as they're working on their task. Um, but it does provide some buff, you know, buffer in there if you can't group the story into one full multi-platform task. Yeah, what, one other like small note I might add on that is um, may, maybe a mental model that can be helpful if you are in that kind of um, more distributed team kind of setup is to like think about your um, shared code the same way you might think about your API, like your remote API. Um, like it's always possible if you're kind of developing your website at the same time as your mobile side that you might have breaking changes and in some sense keeping things in sync is similar. I would I would throw in like I I try to advocate for for like and what Sam was saying is more thinking of like mobile developers as, as opposed to Android or iOS developers because um, the same mental exercise of like what would you do if you had a whole bunch of modules and people were consuming Swift modules but couldn't edit them. It, it, if you've structured your your team that way and your modules that way, then that becomes a bottleneck. And I think people would say, oh, well, this, the iOS developers can edit all the Swift. It's like, well, could they also edit the shared Kotlin too, right? Like that's, you know what I mean? Like if you're gonna treat the SD, a module as something that's consumed by another team that can't change it, there are, structural things you have to deal with and accept and whether that's Kotlin or whether that's just one team that does Swift can't edit an upstream Swift module. It's like the same logical problem. And there are physical differences, of course, but how would you solve that in that case? And, and, and again, or like a remote server based thing. Like it, it is, there are, they're not unsolvable problems, but, but there are similar problems you run into as a team gets larger in any context. 